railway linking inland Australia with major seaports has been proposed for more than 130 years and it's long been championed as nation building. The opportunity that we provide to Australia is to totally change the way that we move freight around the nation. A chance to transform regional towns. It'll become the Memphis of Australia, not only because it has the big Elvis Festival, but because it will be the national logistics hub for Australia in the inland seaboard. And a political point winner. Well, I wanted the inland rail, and now we've got the money, we don't want to lose the money, we want to build it, they've started on it, let's get the thing done. The inland rail was first proposed in the mid-1990s, but it took decades to get a funding commitment, with construction finally beginning in 2018. But there have been some challenges. A decade later, here we are with um, not a huge amount of inland rail built, but some real problems emerging. Lack of consultation is considered first among them, starting with the landscape. They haven't factored the river, they haven't factored the soil, they haven't factored the farming land. Then there's the proposed route. It certainly appeared like most of it was done desktop. To be perfectly honest, I, I think they just looked on Google Maps and went, no problems here, keep going. Today the railway is planned to connect Melbourne to Brisbane via central Victoria, western New South Wales and southern Queensland. The project will upgrade 1,100 kilometres of existing rail line and build 600 kilometres of new track to connect existing corridors. Every 24 hours it'll enable dozens of trains up to 1.8 kilometres long to travel 115 kilometres an hour across three states. Each train has the capacity to carry the same amount of freight as 110 B double trucks. I travelled from Victoria through New South Wales and into Queensland to speak with people along the inland rail route. And there were two distinct perspectives. The enthusiastic big picture proponents and those still not convinced by the current plan. This ambitious project is warmly welcomed in southern New South Wales where a run of good seasons has exporters working year round to get produce to port. This is the first year we've moved into the cotton seed storage and packing, so it has made things quite busy. And as demand for Australia's agricultural goods grows, so too does the pressure on export businesses like this one near Wagga Wagga. Cotton is continuing to grow um, and I think it will probably be you know, 30% bigger next year than it is this year. The region is already well connected by rail to ports in Sydney and Melbourne. And the line here will be part of the inland rail. Exporter Peter Hassel hopes it'll help him meet demand for goods like cotton and grain. Already we have plenty of merchants asking us whether we can handle more of their work. Double stacked trains and more services will be a feature of inland rail, enabling exporters to send goods north or south. It'll also address the issues we have at the moment, trying to get trucks off the road, and also, you know, the huge driver shortage there is in road transport. It's hard to find a more enthusiastic proponent for the inland rail than Parks Mayor Ken Keith. That's the new bridge to go over the railway line of the inland rail. The track upgrades between Parks and Narromine was completed in September 2020. It spurred further construction and major operators and manufacturers are already starting to move into the 4,800 hectare precinct along the line. And we've had major interests at the moment in Brightmark, an American company who recycle plastics, a $260 million facility that they will start building next year. Parks has the most to gain of all towns along the inland rail line. It's at the intersection of the east-west line connecting Perth, Adelaide and Darwin and is positioning itself as a major hub. The year before last we were second only to Byron Bay in the appreciation and value of houses in our community and last year it rose by 26%. So it's still growing year on year and a lot of people taking interest in positioning themselves in parks for the future. But further north, there's still unresolved tension about the inland rail project. 
It stems from the decision of the government-owned company, the Australian Rail Track Corporation, or ARTC, to bypass existing railway lines and build a new track to save time. Although it's still a major grain receival site, Canamble has seen better days. And some are worried the inland rail won't help. The line will bypass the town and dissect Barbara Dean's farm. The other way that it's going to hurt us is that it's not coming past our silos and it's not going to pick up our wheat at a competitive freight price like the other towns like your Moorees, your Narrabris and your Narrabris where, where inland rail is actually right there. Despite the years of work on the inland rail and numerous reports and reviews, Barbara is still looking for answers. If that's what's making us so angry if it was looked at really well, all the right reports done, and they said, no, sorry, Barbara, it's just going to have to go through your farm because that's a benefit for everybody, then I would just have to say, OK, that's what you've got to do. But we have all these meetings, we have all the documents, we have so much yeah, that's saying you didn't do it. You haven't, you haven't looked at the possibilities. Time underpins the very reason for the inland rail. And farmers like Barbara Deans are worried that alternative routes have been ignored in order to keep the transit time under 24 hours. The sub 24 hour transit time is what customers who want to consider moving their uh, supply chains off of roads and onto rails, that is what they are continuing to tell us is important for them. So it's a key design feature. If we don't achieve a sub 24 hour transit time, then we won't get that modal shift onto rail that this is ultimately all about. Farmer Adrian Lyons won't be directly impacted by the new line, but he's worried the cost to those farmers that will be hasn't been properly considered. With the uh, ARTC who are been chartered to build this rail line, it's been an amateur hour and unprofessional from the outset. We have found the staff rotation, the consultation process, a uh, disgrace. He's concerned flooding and erosion from big rain events in the nearby Warrumbungle National Park will be made worse by rail embankments. This is where the inland rail is potentially supposed to go. We're sort of standing in an area where there's a huge amount of water that comes through it and hydrologically wise we're, we're very concerned about how they're going to build that. It's pretty simple. You cannot do a project without consultation, socially or economically. It has to be encompassing of the whole community. Lismore is an exact example of what not to do. Avoid that problem so you don't have devastation like that. That's what we're asking. State approval for the Narramine to Narrabri section of the track is still yet to be granted. And there is an independent review of flood modelling yet to be released. Rebecca Pickering is the CEO of the ARTC. I do understand the concerns of locals who are seeing behaviours in the floodplain right now uh, and how infrastructure can impede flood water. Uh, and we've certainly worked hard to make sure that, that we are not exacerbating those, those issues. So why are they still worried? Yeah, we try to um, take all of the um, concerned landowners through uh, our models to show what is the, uh, the difference in flood levels that our models create. Um, and our designers have worked hard to make sure that we've got enough bridge structures, culverts that allow water to pass through that ensure that that flood water is not exacerbated. We are route agnostic. I'm not telling them whether they should go this way or that way. All I'm saying is you never did your complete st completed studies and they should be now completed independently by a body other than ARTC because it's tainted. But for others in the nearby town of Gilgandra, opportunity outweighs concern and apprehension. The proposed inland rail corridor intersects the Canamble dubbo line here, uh, approximately 20 kilometres north of Gilgandra. So the opportunity here for our, for our local growers as well is to have that connectivity to either uh, you know, export out via Melbourne or you know, head north and go via Brisbane. The inland rail will cross the vast Pilliga Forest to reach Narrabri, about six hours north of Sydney. It's a town built around major cotton and grain industries and home to over 7,000 people. 
upgrades to the existing line are already underway. It's also not far from Santos's Narrabri gas project, and Mayor Ron Campbell is another who's hoping his town will be a manufacturing and export hub. They'll run a pipeline to this thousand acres, our northern New South Wales inland port, and that will be the energy that we'll use, amongst the renewables as well, that we'll use to support what we hope to be a vibrant manufacturing industry. The benefits of the inland rail construction are evident in this local concrete business. Oh, it's boosted the productivity of the business in regards to the material that we're carting out of our quarry and our concrete at the present moment. It's doubled, it's doubled the production. However, Narrabri is built on the banks of the Nemoy River. And when it floods, huge parts of the town can go under. Jim Purcell is a civil engineer specialising in water engineering. And Cara Stoltenberg is a former town planner with the Narrabri Council. They fear the new rail corridor downstream of the town could make flooding worse. The real issue is the embankments at either end. Um, and inland rail are finding that out now as they get into the detailed design um, that there are areas where they were going to have an embankment which they now have to extend the bridge or build another bridge so as to not flood further. What do they say when you bring these criticisms up at these public forums? Well, I've learnt that inland rail have got their own brand of community consultation and that is, you explain the problem and they look you in the eye and say, well, the route is set and will not change. Jim has suggested an alternative route that he says would affect fewer properties and lessen the effect of flooding. If we shifted further downstream, like our alternative suggested, we can save between 100 and 200 million dollars in unnecessary bridges. We can do it with unnecessary impacts. And we can make it a better rail line for inland rail because it's flat, it's straight, and it's easier to build. Now, the engineers know that. When we talk to them, you can tell they understand what we're saying. The problem is, they've been told not to shift anything. Next week, we continue up the inland rail line, where flooding has already torn up some of the old rail corridors. And we'll hear from a former ARTC project director who remains critical of the initial planning process. It was very clear that it had been done in a rush. Rushed? It should have happened like 1950. 49 centimetres is a discrepancy in that height and their modelling. So where else are their measurements out? The inland rail story continues next week on Landline.